Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. If you're ever really exhausted at the end of a long day and you really (laughs) want to go from turned off to turn on, then you're going to love this week's podcast because if you're looking to find more ways to amplify your desire and arousal, you're going to want to listen in as this week on the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Rose. Schlaff. She is a pelvic floor PT, sexual health coach, as well as the founder and CEO of Be Well with Rose. She's very passionate about helping women and queer leaders take the stress out of sex so they can feel energized and excited during intimacy and connect more deeply in all areas of their relationship. So welcome, welcome, Dr. Rose. I'm so happy you're here. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. And I always love to start with kind of learning a little bit about the journey that you've been on with this work, because I know you have been doing this for a while. And yeah, would you share a little bit more about kind of what led you on this path? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I get this question all the time, as I'm sure you do too. (laughs) Right? Like, how the heck did you get here? So I've always been that go-to friend that people share things with, you know, oh, I've never told anyone about this or, oh my gosh, this might be too much information, but I just don't know who else to talk to. And that's always been my superpower is making things that are traditionally untalkaboutable feel really safe and comfortable and, and fun and easy. So I, I loved those conversations that I was having in my personal life. And professionally, I found my way to physical therapy because my mom has a disability. I saw after many, many, many encounters with her amazing physical therapist, how profound an understanding of the human body can be, how much pain and pleasure in the day-to-day life, right? Not even from a sexual standpoint, but moving better, feeling better, how much can be accomplished without medication with physical therapy, which really was like magic in my eyes. So I felt like I had these two parts of me that was like, okay, I have this part that likes talking about sensitive things. I have this part that wants really deeply to understand the human body. And I figured out that pelvic floor physical therapy was a thing. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can still have all this knowledge of the human body, still have all this knowledge about pain and pleasure from a physiological standpoint. And also I can treat the muscles of the pelvis. So I'm talking all day about pee, poop, and sex, which are very sensitive topics. And, you know, I I loved the work that I was doing. It's different than the work I'm doing now a bit because I've gone through my own journey. I was in an incredible facility, biopsychosocial approach. We had myself, a sex therapist, a sexual medicine physician, all evaluating and treating the same people. I was learning a ton from this approach. And I also, at the same time, was really struggling deeply with my own health. I had pretty intense anxiety for the first time in my life. I was having panic attacks. I was feeling... I lifelong extrovert over here. And I was feeling really drained, depleted by my human interactions, both with my patients, but also with my partner, I felt this disconnect and I didn't really know what was going on. So I went to the doctor, we figured out I had a big hormonal imbalance in my thyroid that was creating heart palpitations, panic attacks, all the things that I was experiencing. So my nerdy physical therapy brain was like, Oh, good. It's a physiological issue. Let's, let's just address these hormones and get me back to normal. And, you know, I worked with that endocrinologist for about a year and a half and it got a little better. And during that time I was working with a therapist because practice what you preach. I, I was working in a biopsychosocial model. I, I knew that even though it started as a hormonal imbalance, there were still psychological impacts of that. And that helped a little bit, but I still, at the end of a year, felt pretty out of control of my body, felt really disconnected to my body, disconnected to people around me, and was just struggling to connect and enjoy my life like I had been prior to this experience. And I remember sitting in that endocrinologist's office and he had this big look on his face and he was like, congratulations, your numbers are normal. And it was the biggest gut punch (laughs) that I ever could have gotten because it felt in that moment, like the medical system, the system that I had, you know, invested 
all of my time becoming a part of, you know, at this point I had a doctorate in physical therapy and had been practicing it. I really felt like it had failed me. I didn't really know where to go next. I was like, I tried therapy. I tried hormones. Why, why aren't I feeling better? And that's when I really went on a journey of self-discovery and it took me a couple different places, but one was functional nutrition. One was coaching. And what really came out of this was identifying that I wasn't looking at myself in the system. I think that a lot of us as individuals just identify with traits that have truly been socialized into us. Everyone who is socialized as female or most people anyways, have been socialized to care deeply for others, have been socialized to put others needs ahead of our own, have been socialized to be perfect, right? We have to be perfect to be worthy of the same jobs, the same pay, right? There's still a big pay gap. And so I I was really identifying these things as my personality, right? Oh, I'm just so caring. I'm just a perfectionist. I care so deeply. And really what I started to recognize was these are all products of the systems that were raised in. And when I started having these conversations with myself, but also my patients, patients who were navigating pregnancy and postpartum were navigating difficulty reconnecting to their bodies and their partners after their baby or throughout menopause and, or throughout a painful experience or trauma. When I was talking about these things, I noticed a bigger shift than when we were just addressing the physical, than when we were just seeing this kind of surface individual approach. And so for me, that really put me on the path of where I am today, which is yes, addressing the physical aspects of what makes sex fun and and makes it good to feel, you know, feel good in our body, feel pleasure in our body, feel connected to ourselves, to each other, but also what's going on in our society that creates a barrier for that? And, and how do we navigate the psychological issues that, that come from that? We all have mindset and physiological responses to these things that we've been raised in that may be happening behind the scenes. We may not even realize. So, so really my joy now is using my own personal struggle, my own journey of discovery to connect the dots instead of having so many different individuals that we go to and try to put the pieces together ourselves. I love putting the pieces together with my clients and I love helping women and queer leaders take that stress and heaviness and disconnection out of life transitions and really create ease, joy, connection, fun. It should feel light and it can feel light. So I love that. And I think there's so many listening that can relate. And I know so often my clients share the same of, you know, going through the medical system and everything's checking out, but they still feel awful or it's still like, but it's not right. I know. And it's like, you know, it can be challenging to navigate those waters. And so I love that kind of the understanding that you've gained throughout your years of experience has like led you to this place of being able to guide others. Yes. And it's so important to note, I did have a physiological issue. I did have a massive hormonal imbalance, which triggered this whole shift in my body. However, even when start, something starts as a physical issue, right? Like pregnancy or postpartum or even physical pain or endometriosis or menopause, even when something starts as a physical issue, there is this waterfall of other effects. And until we can address you as a whole, even if the physical is addressed, there may be secondary issues that are continuing to keep you stuck in that pattern. And that's what happened with me. Yeah. The the holistic approach is so key. And I think too, like you were mentioning, you know, so much of our structural system is set up on, you know, extraction and just really not conducive to our health, not conducive to health. Right. And so it can be really common that, you know, especially leaders and people that, you know, are ambitious or, you know, anyone really that's like doing what they think they should do in the world is often like you work hard, you give, you sacrifice yourself for others, all the things that you mentioned. And so, you know, oftentimes people might not necessarily connect the dots of, oh, okay. So I appreciate that aspect too. And I think, you know, you mentioned too, you know, you're working a lot with leaders. And um, this is a question that I thought would be interesting because I think oftentimes it's really we, like you say, the holistic view is so important, but oftentimes we are very good at segmenting things in our life, right? Mm-hmm. We segment work, then we segment family life, then we segment parenting, and then we segment our relationship, then we segment our sex life. But really, it all is so intertwined. 
Yes, right? it is. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what might your pelvic floor and your professional success have in common? Yeah. Or like how they affect each other. Yes, absolutely. And and I think this is so important to note because they are all interconnected. And the way you do one thing is often mirrored in the way you do many things. So for me, prior to my experience, I was showing up, I was at a world renowned facility, I was in a really high level place in my career. And the energy behind it was very different than the energy that I bring now. (laughs) So I, I think a lot of the time we learn how to play the game that's set ahead of us for what we've learned we have to do in society to be successful. And we do it. We check the boxes. We, we learn how to be a leader. We do, we learn how to lead our team. We learn how to be there for our family, for our friends. And we've gotten very good at that. But what I see happen is there's this disconnect between this high achieving everywhere else in your life. Sometimes I I say you're a badass everywhere else in your life, but then your sex life is kind of this dirty little secret. That's like where you feel like you're not quite hitting the mark or not quite feeling like you could or should be feeling. And it feels out of alignment because you're used to being really, really great and most areas of your life and setting your goals and achieving them. So what I see is because we've learned, okay, this, this doesn't really matter for the rest of my life. I can deal with that later. It often comes last on the list. And when I work with people, when we start bringing pleasure, not just, it's not just about sex, right? Pleasure can be, and should be laced Mm -hmm. throughout your entire life. And when we start bringing pleasure and we start practicing the things that I think make sex and intimacy the most fun, right? Like asking, asking for what you desire, checking in with yourself and identifying what do I even want? What do I even need? Asking for those things to mean that the practice of receiving (laughs) that is so difficult. Oh my gosh. Especially people socialize as female. Wow. It is so much easier for us to give than receive, but the practice of receiving the practice of being present while you're receiving, not thinking about how you're going to reciprocate or give back all of these tools that, that we use to make sex more fun, to make intimacy feel better are things that when we start to embrace them in this area, bleed out to the rest of our life. And we're able to ask for what we need professionally in our family, in our friendships, we're able to identify our desires more clearly. A lot of the time, this was certainly true for me. I felt like I was playing the game of life. It was like, okay, get your doctorate. Okay. Get this great job. Okay. Buy the house. Okay. Check, 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 check. And is that, I've heard that reflected back from many of my clients. So I've done the things I've accomplished the goals and still I feel Mm -hmm something is missing and I don't know what I want, but I want something else. And so that practice of connecting to your desires and identifying that can help you in every area of your life. And I've had clients who, um, I was just talking to a client the other day, who's a trauma therapist herself. And she shared with me, I'm a better trauma therapist now because I'm able to be present in my body and just be there with my client without worrying so much about the give and take and and what's happening and, oh my gosh, am I doing a good enough job or all the stories that run through our brain, just like they run through our brain in the bedroom (laughs) and then through our brain outside the bedroom. So I think there is a huge connection and we can't separate these things. And hey, if we're stressed in life, they've seen, studies have shown when you're hooked up to an electromagnetic sensor and you're showed a scary movie, your shoulders and your pelvic floor are the first things to contract. So it's like, if you're stressed, Mm -hmm. your pelvic floor is tense and tight. So same with your nervous system, your whole body. And if you're relaxed and receiving, your pelvic floor is able to relax, rest, receive, enjoy. So it's connected physically. It's connected in our behavior in all areas. I think that is such a common thing, especially for, like you say, people that are leaders or work hard, right? It's that go, go, go kind of collective spell that we have been taught. But Uh it is, it's like that kind of 
it does inhibit that ability to kind of shift gears sometimes, right? Because mm-hmm. you're busy leading your team, you know, slaying it at work, all the things. And then you come home and you're like, it's hard to turn that yeah. off. Yeah. And so I have a few questions about this. But before I ask you those, I'm curious, and maybe this all goes together. But, you know, when you're feeling that tension and stress, obviously, it's a lot harder to relax. It's a lot harder to surrender, which is very important in to be able to like receive fully and mm-hmm. to enjoy whatever experience you're in, whether that's, you know, at your board meeting or, you know, enjoying some delicious sex with your lover. So yes. I'm curious, you know, what would be some tips that you have to kind of relax the pelvic floor or kind of move into like, how do you turn off that desire to like nonstop? to yes. actually slow down and receive. <laughs> yes, it's so hard to turn off go mode, <laughs> especially when we are so rewarded for it in our culture in every other area. So what I love to talk about is two pieces. So the first piece is our, our breath is incredibly powerful for many reasons, but our pelvic floor and our diaphragm, which is the organ that we breathe with, it lives under our rib cage, work together like a piston in a car. So every time we breathe, if we are using our diaphragm, then our pelvic floor is moving. So as we breathe in and you'll notice because you can feel your rib cage expand left and right, you may feel some sensation in your belly or even lower all the way down to your pelvic floor. As you breathe in, your pelvic floor lowers and stretches and relaxes. And then as you breathe out, your pelvic floor contracts and lifts. And this is so important because there's many different places that we can get stuck in our pelvis. So one, a lot of the time, this like go, go, go mentality, we're kind of ready on. Um, If you've ever noticed at the end of the day, like, oh my gosh, my shoulders are so tense or, oh my gosh, I've totally been clenching my jaw or just noticing some tension in your body. There's a good chance that your pelvic floor might be holding on to that as well. So each breath that you do in this manner is allowing blood to flow through the pelvis. It's allowing your tissues to relax, release, and just kind of move. It's like, if you were, I always talk about this, like, I don't know if this even applies to younger generations anymore, but like cell phone arm or or phone, you know, when you're, you've been holding your phone up for a long time on a great conversation, and then you straighten your elbow for the first time after that, you're like, Oh my God, my elbow's so sore. And you kind of have to do the tin man and, and shake it out a little bit, relax it. Same thing with breathing for our pelvic floor. Another incredible piece of breathing is we have our respiratory organ. Our diaphragm has the vagus nerve, which is our most important nerve for shifting into our restful nervous system. So our action taking nervous system that we're in a lot of the day where we're taking action, we're making decisions, we're in this sympathetic fight and flight mode. And so to just signify, okay, I'm not in survival mode. I'm not taking action. I get to relax and shift into a different part of my night. That breathing can be really powerful to shift us. So that's the first part. And then the second part of this is really developing a system, a system. I call it like a sexy system or a ritual (laughs) where you are actually telling your brain and body, Hey, that part of our day is done. We are shifting now. And this can look different for anyone, but some of my clients do this with a playlist. They'll just dance to a song. Some of my clients do this with a bath or a walk outside or a run or a shower or uh, an eye gazing activity with their partner or just three deep breaths together or a long hug, right? What are we telling our body? Okay. That part of our day is done. The next part is here. And I think during COVID, this became even harder because truly many of us were working from home. I heard a lot of my clients say I'm drinking more frequently because that's the only thing that's telling my brain and body I'm not working anymore. And so this is really important to have a ritual. Maybe you change your clothes, maybe you do something else, but that ritual is important, especially if you work from home. The rituals are so key. I love that. I always have a similar type of thing that I, you know, we work with a lot of times kind of similar people here and there, but you know, that transition ritual is so key and it's, you can do it anytime, right? Yeah. It's like really the power of intention and ritual. I cannot state it up. It's so yeah. key. And I love even too, like one of the things that works for myself and my husband is we often will just like lay in bed for like 15 minutes and just yeah. talk and like yeah. connect and just like let all that craziness dissolve. And one of the beautiful things about 
working from home if your schedule so allows, or I actually try to really <laughs> make sure my schedule allows, is uh-huh. that there's time in the day that we can connect. Yes. Because that sometimes is the only time we have alone. And so it's really nice to make that time. But we also are very much in work mode. So we both need like, okay, let's chill out for 15 minutes and just mm-hmm. lay and chat. Mm-hmm. And then we feel much more in the mood. Yeah. I or, love that you yeah. shared that because I think that's also important to know. We've just been kind of taught that sex happens at night mm-hmm. a lot of the time. And we're like, oh, I'm so tired or yeah. oh, I just did so much today. And maybe I do have a hard time shifting my brain at night. But I love that you and your partner both work from home. So you have this flexibility. But also, maybe it's a weekend day. Maybe if you have kids, you have your kids go on a play date for a weekend day or, you know, getting creative with yeah. what are the best times for me where it's easiest for me to connect, where it's easiest for me to be present with my partner. And that might be in the middle of your day. And it might be, it might be late at night for you. That might work, but just having permission to explore and knowing that there's no wrong time. Yeah. I love that too. One of the things I think is fun often I, when you have kids, I recommend doing like the sexy Saturdays where like, yes. okay, you go to your friends for three hours and they come yes. here for three hours and like, you can do the swap, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that you can have some alone time with your partner. So I love that. Okay. So now tell me some more about ways of, you know, shifting that into that more relaxed, like turn off the work mode, get into the sexy mode. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I I think it's important to note that with responsive desire, we, it's a multi-part system, right? So we first need to decrease the stress and shift into that parasympathetic nervous system, just like we were talking about either with breathing and, or a ritual to shift your body, but we also need to be exposing ourselves to something that's a little bit sexy. And the way that I describe this is say you had me over for lunch and I had eaten a a big breakfast. I wasn't really hungry when I got to your house, but your cooking smells so good. Oh my gosh. And as soon as I start smelling your cooking, I'm like, I got to eat some of this food. It just smells way too good not to eat. (laughs) I didn't know I wanted it. I didn't know I needed it. But now that I'm smelling it, I do. And so every person will be triggered in different ways with responsive desire. But knowing your triggers, knowing your go-tos, does that mean we're listening to sexy audio stories beforehand? Does that mean we're watching a sexy show together? Does that mean after our 15 minutes of downtime where we just chat, maybe for 10 minutes, we're just touching each other's legs and lower stomachs? just giving our bodies a chance to warm up to the idea of being aroused. I think so often we start, okay, we got, we got 15 minutes in the middle of our workday. Let's go straight to the clitoris or straight, you know, like right to the money. And I think we're really doing ourselves a disservice by not allowing our nervous system to catch up. And if we create space, even five minutes of space, it can make such a difference for how present we are to the touch once we are doing direct genital touch or how much we're enjoying it and aroused during. We've all had that experience where we think we're going to get into it faster than we do. And then we're kind of in it and we're like, okay, this is good, but it's, you know, we know it could be better. And that's, that's not my desire for any of us. I think my desire for all of us is to be met with this ease and excitement and fun during every stage of connection, during every stage of intimacy. And I really love playing, I, I'm sure you you know this game, but um, there's an incredible sex educator who developed a game called the three minute game. And basically there's one giver, one receiver, and each person has two turns in that role. And so when you're the giver, you have one turn where you say, this is how I'd like you to touch me. And then the, or when you're the receiver, you say, this is how I'd like you to touch me. And then when the next turn comes, the giver gets to say, I'd like to touch you like this. And there's discussion back and forth. Okay. Yes. I'd love to touch your feet, but no, I don't want to touch your big toe. Those weird me out for whatever reason, but I'd love to touch your ankles instead. Right. There's a discussion, but I I think sometimes people get overwhelmed even by four rounds of three minutes. That's 12 minutes of touch. What's that going to look like? Is it going to be awkward? Where are we going to go? And sometimes even starting with 30 seconds or one minute, it's like four minutes to shift, go, go, go mode 
into, okay, we're touching. That feels good. Oh my gosh. I haven't had my hair touched in so long. Or oh, now that you're touching my back, I actually think I want you to touch my inner thigh. This actually feels really good. So just allowing your body and brain to catch up and be on the same page can be really beautiful. I love that so much. That's Betty Martin. And I, she's amazing. And it's, it's so true because there's numerous things, right? Like you might love to, to touch your partner a certain way, but they might not to re- like to receive it that way. Yes. Right. And so, and you also need to be able to have those discussions, like here's how you like to be touched. So you want to touch your partner the way they like to be touched and find out also what, when there is something that you want to do, what's the way you can do that in a way they enjoy. Yes. Right. It's like, cause so often we, we don't have those conversations and sometimes you don't necessarily want to talk. So just being in the process of the doing can help. Yeah, to put it into words, right? Because you might not know how to verbalize it in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's why these games can be so helpful because you're not in a, it's a less stress situation in a way, right? You're like, we're going to play a game. Yeah. We're like, we got one minute on the clock. We (laughs) probably can't mess this up, you know? (laughs) Right. Yes. I think that's fun too. Like, and I'd love for you to share a little bit, you know, if, because I think oftentimes what can happen, maybe if you are, are in the cycle of things aren't great in the bedroom and then there's stress around it. And then there's that, all the waterfall of things that happen that cascade to make you feel avoidant or have a lot of stress around sex. So what would be maybe some ways you can kind of relieve some of that anxiety or stress about, okay, this is going to happen and, and more ease into it with more fun and pleasure. Absolutely. So there's so many different ways that we can do this. And it, it really depends on what level of stress, overwhelm, avoidance you're at. So obviously starting my career as a pelvic floor physical therapist, I worked a lot with people who were experiencing physical pain during penetration. And that level of fear surrounding sex is profound. And it's not uncommon. 75% of people with vulvas have discomfort or pain with penetration at one time and over 30% continue to have pain. So If you're listening to this and you've ever felt discomfort, I want you to know you're not alone, but you're also, this is something that can shift. You don't need to experience pain. And so something that can be really helpful when you're really at the end of this spectrum where you're just dreading sex or feeling really fearful about it. And maybe you once enjoyed it, but it's just gotten to a place where it feels so heavy. I really recommend taking sex off the table for a period of days. And when I say sex, everyone's definition of sex is different. My definition of sex is very different than most people's. I don't define sex as penis and vagina or even orgasms at all. For me, sex is any time that we're together and touching or I'm alone and touching and feeling good, right? There doesn't even need to be touched. It's just a connection with my body and my pleasure and my erotic nature. So for you, if sex looks a lot of different ways, maybe that's saying, okay, I love it when we hug. I love it when we cuddle. I love it when we kiss, but I notice that I'm feeling a lot of fear around penetration. And, um, I would love for the next three weeks to take penetration off the table because my ultimate goal is for us to get back to a place where we're having more frequent intimacy and feeling really excited about it. And so during that time, when we're taking penetration off the table, I would love for us to explore more external touch. And maybe we're playing the three minute game, maybe we're not, but I want to create some times for us to explore together. And so taking the pressure off of penetration, taking the the pressure off of orgasm can be incredibly freeing. And also we can create a space where it's like, oh, that's easy. We have four minutes. Let's play the one minute game. Okay. That's, we did our homework for the week. We connected. I love that. So key, like then there's that less pressure. I'm curious now, because it is true. You know, I know we, we've, we've talked about this on the podcast around what to do when you have pelvic pain and how to seek out support. But oftentimes there's multi-pronged approaches, which is like, yeah. oh, you got to look at the holistic mm-hmm. view. And so maybe if there isn't pain, but there's just maybe, maybe there's discomfort or just shame even that can be a huge, and that actually can present as physical pain. So I'm wondering, you know, what might be some advice you have around that? Yes. So I would say what I just said goes for anyone, not just people with pain, but anyone who is feeling like sex has really become a chore 
you're really feeling like it's a should. You're feeling a lot of pressure to perform. You're feeling a lot of resentment about it. Although you wish you didn't feel anger and resentment, you're starting to feel it creep in. That is a really good indication that we need to create a big boundary and that boundary doesn't need to last forever, but we need to create a boundary so that your nervous system can begin to feel safe again with connection. And whether it's taking penetration off the table for three weeks or taking all physical touch outside of handholding and, and hugging off the table for three weeks, that those are options, but we can also decrease the pressure and stress by saying, okay, for the next three weeks, I want to do an experiment. I want us to connect physically and I want us to not create a goal towards orgasm. I want us to just connect physically and see what feels good. That's an option. You can also, I think there's a lot of pressure around initiation and, oh my gosh, are they going to ask me when I'm tired and I'm tired of rejecting them and I've rejected them three times already. So gosh, I, I should just do this. You know, I should just do it. And we never want to push through that feeling. Although responsive desire exists, we have to at least feel an inkling of interest towards it, right? Just like the, the food example, I smelled your food cooking and then I got in the mood. But if I got there and you were like, eat the food, eat the food, I would probably be like, no, no matter how good that food feels, you're really shoving this food on me. That doesn't sound good to me. So really being in touch with what feels good to you and what feels like a hell yes. Even if it's a hell yes, I'm open to trying and I can change my mind at any time. But mm -hmm. truly identifying what part of this feels stressful. Is it the initiation part? Okay, then we decide my best hours to try this are Saturday mornings. Every other Saturday morning, we're going to send our kids on a play date. And every other Saturday morning, that's the time we connect. And outside of that Saturday morning time, we both know that it's off the table. So when you hold my hand, when you rub my shoulders, when you cuddle me, I can relax and know that this is just a cuddle. It's not for a purpose, for a, a next outcome. And so that's another really beautiful way. If you mm -hmm. want to continue intimacy in your full spectrum, but you just want to feel like you know exactly when it's coming so you don't have to worry about it or, or you don't have to worry if you're not on the same page, that's another great way to set a boundary. Yeah. And I know in a little bit, you're going to share more about an awesome little fun, sexy Mad Lib you have around these communication around your, you know, and during sex and whatnot. But here's something that I hear a lot. And I know I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. You know, like you say, it's so important to be able to really honor what your body needs in the moment to moment, yes. like really being present moment to moment and being able to say no whenever you want to say no and have that respected or have feel confident in saying the no without fear of, like you say, rejecting your partner. And so I'm curious what, you know, what's some ways you can share that, right? When you're in the action and you want to stop, it's totally okay. And mm -hmm. a lot of times people are like, well, you know, I've already made it this far. Let's just like get it over with whatever, which is really not a healthy thing to do for yourself because you're right. in a way you're overriding your own boundary, which we do like we're all human. Like we're going to mm -hmm. sometimes do that. But when you notice it happening all the time, that is when a lot of resentment can build and pain mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. it's really important to speak that. And so I'm curious what you could share around that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really hard to say no. And it's really hard to say no when we've previously said yes. This is something we need to practice. And I find that sometimes a verbal no uh, can be even harder. So sometimes just starting with a nonverbal cue of, all right. I've noticed that sometimes I think that I'm going to like something. And then when we get in it, it actually feels too sensitive, or I actually um, notice that I'm not quite into it, but I have a hard time saying it when we're in the moment. Could we identify a hand signal or a, a word that could help me communicate that with you in a succinct way? Because sometimes it's really the communication of it of like, oh God, I'm going to have to do this whole big explanation and then it's going to take us out of the moment and oh, it's exhausting. Oh God, okay, I, I just would rather not. So instead having this discussion beforehand and saying, all right, when I tap your shoulder or when I squeeze your, your upper arm, right? Whatever works for you. Or when I say mango, that's when we know okay, we're going to switch gears. And another thing that you can plan ahead of time is after that signal is given, what is the 
thing that always pretty much feels good. <laughs> like what's, what's something that goes back to baseline? So it could be, all right, when I give you the signal, I want to just come back to cuddling and eye gazing. And then we can decide from there what we want to do, but we might just end there. And actually explicitly getting that reassurance from your partner of, would you be disappointed if that happened or would that be okay? Can be so freeing. We just don't, we're not having these conversations. And in our brain, we feel that heaviness of the fear of disappointing our partner, the fear of letting them down. And most of the time, our partner is like, oh my God, of course I wouldn't want you to do anything that you don't feel good with. Of course it would be okay. Of course I love cuddling you. And Another piece of this is if we have those times where we know, okay, we're connecting back in, we have our ritual, there's not so much pressure on, on the, the few moments where we're intimate. It's like, of course, this was a great Saturday and we're going to try our next sexy Saturday. Yeah. And I think it's getting the, you know, kind of working through whatever might be standing in the way of you having those discussions. And mm -hmm. you can do that. Like there's lots of tools where if you feel like you need more support, then it's available for you as well. But just knowing oftentimes when you can feel comfortable having those conversations, it's a huge celebration yes. because it can allow there to be new connection in new ways. And oftentimes, especially if we've been in a partnership with someone for a while, we might just assume, right, that they're going to respond this way or assume like, this is what's going to go down or assume X means Y. Mm -hmm. And so it can be really hard to kind of step back and give the opportunity for new possibilities to bubble up. Yes. But like you say, most of the time, our partners do want to please us and they want, they don't want to be doing anything that's not enjoyed. Right. Yeah. And if they, and if you're not enjoying it, they probably know on some level and they're that, you know, they're not enjoying that either. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it makes it good for everyone. Yeah. Truly. And so I'm wondering too, you know, when it comes to, I'd love to hear this perspective because I know oftentimes when vulva owners in particular can find ways to find more pleasure in their sexuality, it really does kind of amp up their confidence and their magnetism in all areas of life. I see this all the yeah. time and I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. So I'd love for you to speak maybe a little to that or what are some of the things that you see and why you think this work is so important just for when you put the two and two together, like, oh, I never would have thought that <laughs> enhancing my sexuality makes me more successful, but it really does. I mean, I yeah. think that goes back to Think and Grow Rich with Napoleon Hill, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. It does. It does. And just like we are needing to, to practice all of these techniques, right? Releasing the outcome of penetration or orgasm, just enjoying the process of connection, staying present in our bodies, feeling like we can say anything, that courageousness that comes with practicing the no, even if it's a no that you previously said yes to, the confidence that you develop when you have shown your body, hey, I listen when you say no, it matters to me. And I, not only do I have the awareness, but I'm acting upon it and I'm protecting you. That's huge. There's so many little micro no's that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And just the nervous system stress that we undergo when that no feels really scary, when we feel really triggered by the, the thought of disappointing someone or, oh my gosh, what are they going to think about me? And to have all that practice, it lessens the burden of those thoughts, but then also it lessens the burden of the secondary harm that's happening mm -hmm. when we say yes and we mean no. Yeah. Where we feel that sink in our stomach after, oh, sure, I'll pick you up from the airport. No problem. Oh God, I actually, why did I say that? <laughs> I could never say no now because I already said yes. And those moments, that's our precious energy. And we're just reclaiming little by little by little our energy. And we're honoring little by little by little our desires, our needs. And that makes us so powerful and so magnetic. And I know that we've been taught. I know I was taught that the best thing you can do to other for other people is to bend over backwards and help them and do everything for them. And I've learned over this time that the best thing I can do for other people is lead by example and show what's possible, honoring my pleasure, honoring my desires, honoring my no's, honoring my yeses. And that in and of itself is humongously powerful, not just for you, but for the people around you, for your friends, for your family, 
oh my God, I've seen my entire family change since I started this work years ago. Entire family. And there's such potency in that and how it spreads around to every thing that you touch, right? Yes. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I feel like I could just keep talking with you. But I'm wondering too, is there any question that you wish I would have asked or any last things you'd like to make sure that you share? Great question. I I think what I would love to share is if you're listening to this, I want you to know that there are so many things that we can do that feel fun and easy and can be easily incorporated on a daily basis to help you shift to a place where you do feel light, you do feel free both in and out of the bedroom. And if any of this resonated with you, I love to talk to people about this stuff. Please message me on Instagram at be well with Rose. Please feel free to email me. I work with people one-on-one in groups and couples, and it's my joy. It is my joy to do this work. And even when I don't work with people, I love seeing their journeys as they've discovered resources through me. I think we're not talking about sex enough in our society. We're not talking about pleasure enough in our society. And I think if you listen to Amanda's podcast, you are that person who is changing your system of friends, your system of work, your system of family. You're the one. And that that change will ripple out from you, from everything you learn. But if you are taking this information and you're like, okay, I want to apply it. How does this apply to me? Please reach out. I do free 15 minute phone calls. And I love, even if we don't work together, I love directing people to the right resources. And I love in so, and also I know you mentioned that you have a resource around communication that you were going to share. So would you mind telling yes. and where they can find that? Yes. So I hear all the time, oh my gosh, where do I even start the conversation about sex? I just feel so awkward. I feel so uncomfortable. I don't know what to say and not fun. It, it feels really heavy. So I developed a resource that is meant to be fun, <laughs> meant to be silly. You can do it solo. It's a great learning experience for you, but you can also do it with your partner and it creates this opportunity to just laugh and be silly together. And if anything is awkward and weird, you can blame me. You can be like, oh my God, this this doctor who developed this is a weirdo, right? And you can laugh together. And that's okay because sex gets to be silly. It gets to be fun. And I want you to have that experience. So it's called Let's Talk About Sex. And it's a fill in the blank Mad Lib style guide. And you can find that at www.bewellwithrose.com slash talk. Beautiful. Awesome. And I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well and where everyone can connect with you. And thank you so much again for being here. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. And it's just a joy. We were talking before we started recording. We're like, this is my favorite thing to do. So I'm yes. totally in my pleasure right now. <laughs> totally. I know. And I, and if, you know, and just to, just to like really allow yourself to drop in and say, okay, what out of this was a nugget that I really want to hold on to? You know, what was maybe something that I got from this episode that will be a support moving forward? And mm-hmm. um, hopefully there were some resources that do help you feel less stress around sex, give you some more tools around transitioning from your busy day to, you know, a more relaxing and connecting evening with your partner or your loved ones, and also some great tools on communicating around yeah. sex. So thank you so much again, Dr. Rose. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And please let us know what your nuggets, what your takeaways are. Message us. I love hearing yes. what, what's your, what's your action step after this? What are you going to try? We're all sexy scientists. I love it. <laughs> sexy science. It's the best kind. It is. It is. <laughs> and thank you all so much for listening. We will look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, this is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please 
share with your friends, go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.